All right, so uh, welcome back, uh, day three. Uh, I was forced to uh, do something a little bit different here on OBS because this didn't uh, immediately connect. Uh, so hopefully it doesn't slow us down terribly too much. Uh, but if it does, I don't know if anybody's streaming here and let me know if it does start cracking out or something, anything like that. Um, uh, I'm not able to, uh, to check it out, so hopefully it, it works. Otherwise, we've got almost everybody is here. Uh, hopefully, not not everybody is going to rely on this uh, uh, this recording. But in any case, uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to move on. Or w what we did for the last day and a half or so, lecture and a half, is we looked at that motivating example, right? And that motivating example was basically a precursor to the first uh, topic of this course, which is brute force algorithms. Uh, remember that we uh, the, the purpose of this was that we went through every single possible pair to find the cl two closest p uh, pair of points in a uh, in a list. And we witnessed on Wednesday that this naive kind of brute force way, we didn't call it brute force at the time, but this naive way of looking at every single possible pair uh, w was actually quite bad when we had a million points, for example. Uh, if we had 10 million, uh, 100 million points, uh, we, we, we calculated that it would take about 100 years for us to uh, actually uh, execute that program. So uh, I didn't call it brute force, but that's what it was. Trying every single possibility. That's what brute, brute force is all, uh, all about. Uh, so brute force style algorithms uh, simply try every single possibility. Right? Uh, either you, are, you find the best solution Right. In which case, you have to. How do you know that it's the best solution? You have to look at them all, right? Uh, maybe it depends on what the uh, what the problem is. There are some problems that lend themselves to what are called greedy solutions or heuristics or something like that, where you don't have to look at every single possible solution. You can immediately solve it and find the optimal solution. Uh, this is uh, these are optimization problems, optimization problems, right? Uh, you need to examine, uh, examine, sorry, every possible uh, uh, possible solution to determine if they are valid or feasible, right? In other words, you're looking for, you don't even know if a solution exists. Uh, these are called decision problems, right? Uh, decision problems, uh, where uh, you want to know, does there, ex you know, for example, with the um, every pair of points that there has to, at least if I have at least two points, I know that there are two points that are closest to each other. You know that there is a solution. Other problems, you may not know that there's a solution at all. Uh, satisfiability or Hamiltonian path, these are things that we'll look at later on that are not optimization problems. You just want to find simply a solution. Does a solution exist? Um, or you need to create a solution. These are called functional problems. And one functional problem that lends itself to a comical brute force solution would be sorting. Everybody in here knows how to sort, right? So you throw insertion sort or selection sort. Those are kind of slow, bad uh, quadratic sorting algorithms, right? Uh, so instead you throw quick sort or merge sort at the problem and th those are much faster. Uh, well, neither one of those is brute force. You're not trying every single possible ordering and saying, is that it? Is that it? Is that it? Until you get down to the permutation that actually uh, represents a sorted list, right? Uh, so there are things where you don't need brute force solutions. There are things where we don't know of any other solution besides brute force solutions. Uh, in general, it's not a great, uh, a, a, a great solution, right? In general, brute forcing is not ideal, right? It is not efficient, it is not feasible. Uh, you, won't, you won't get it within your lifetime, for example, if you try to find the closest pair of points in 100, 100 million points with a Python program that we just wrote. Um, often creating, uh, uh, creating a brute, and let me know if this is not big enough. Uh, it's big enough for me over here, but and it's a small enough class that I hope that we can go all uh, see that. Uh, but if not, let me know, and I'll go ahead and increase the size. Often creating a brute force uh, algorithm means generating combinatorial objects. Right? 
And that's what we're going to do. In fact, that's what we already did, right? What, did, what kind of combinatorial objects did we generate with this kind of solution here? Uh, and we were looking at pairs, right? We generated pairs or combinations of two from a set of n elements. Right. I'll go ahead and typeset that here. Right. If you're interested, you know, I will put LaTeX throughout my notes and I'll push them up uh, to GitHub. And when you see it, you can check out the LaTeX and ah, how, do they, how do you do that summation there or whatever. Uh, and it'll, it'll be up there. Also note that the notes that I generate on my good notes here, uh, I've been converting those to PDF and I've also been pushing those to GitHub. Uh, so, uh, of course, I will update them as we go along. Yeah, go ahead. What about your Python? Uh, I actually threw it all away, so sorry. Uh, but uh, no, I've not pushed that. I, I didn't plan on pushing it. Um, so, but it's, it's in the videos. Uh, all right. So, we need to generate combinatorial objects. So, what I want to do is I want to take what we've already done, generating, perme uh, generating combinations of size 2, and I want to generalize that, okay? Uh, so let me go over here to my good notes. Right. Remember, we are on uh, Piazza here. Uh, could you please promote partner search on Piazza again? Uh, you can, uh, make, make sure that you're posting to it. Uh, again, if you're looking for a partner, there is a, uh, a, a, a pinned tag, a pinned post at the top of uh, Piazza, and uh, all you have to do is fill it out. What I would recommend if you're looking for a partner is Tell, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, what's your background. Uh, like, uh, yeah, I'm a Python guru. Please team up with me uh, well, and let's do it in Python. Or uh, I don't know anything about Python uh, so, so that you can team up with somebody that, all right, let's learn Python together or something. You're a night owl or you like to get up at five. I get up at five. I didn't say that I like to get up at five, but I do every day. Uh, and so if you're, a, if you're a morning person, if you're a night person, if you like working on weekends or whatever, try to find that compatible uh, a partner if you're looking for a partner. All right. So there you go. All right. Okay. So before we do that, though, I need to make sure that we're all on the same page. What are combinations? So in general, K combinations. All right. So given a set of n elements. And usually we denote it as one, two, three, dot, 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 n, right? Uh, it's enough to consider, ele uh, you know, just uh, uh, combinations and permutations eventually of integers one through n. Why? Well, what if you wanted to consider uh, permutations or combinations of strings? or combinations of letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G instead. All you have to do is take whatever you want a combination or a permutation of, put that into a fixed list or array or whatever, or give, it, give it some ordering. And then all you have to do is use your one, two, three, four, five as indices for that thing. And then if you generate a K combination of, of integers, then all you have to do is map that to your list and you've generated a K combination of the things that you're trying to do, right? If you're talking about people, right? Uh, Alice, Bob, uh, uh, Colton, dot, 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 and then Ned, right, at the end. Uh, then all you have to do is associate Alice with one, Bob with two, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and it, all you need to do is permute or uh, take a combination of one, two, three, four, five, and map it back to the people that you're trying to, to permute or uh, take a combination of. Right? So it's not that big of a deal that we're only going to focus on these integers here. Uh, and by the way, if you are using a programming language where you've got zero indexing, all you have to do is what? Subtract one, right? So given a set of n elements, a k combination is a subset of cardinality or size Okay. Okay. Uh, how about an example? And for this example, I will use A, B, and C. Actually, I'll use A, B, C, and D. What are all the two combinations of this? I could pair A and B, right? 
What else? Could I pair B and A? Nope. Well, I mean, I could, but what is a subset? It's an unordered collection. So in other words, these two things are the same. So we're not going to consider them. Right? So what's another two combination here? BC, okay. What else? AC, right? AA, uh, you could do that if you want combinations with repetition, but we're not going to go that far. Uh, combinations with repetition would mean that you're not dealing with sets, you are dealing with multi-sets. And things can, uh, things can appear more than once. If something appears more than once, that's called its mo uh, thing, now, uh, modality, right? right? The, uh, no, multiplicity, sorry, not modality, mo multiplicity. How many, if it appears three times, then it has multiplicity three, right? That's the proper term. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, and then AD, since I said ABCD. What else? Mm -hmm. BD. And I, of course, once I I've got B, I don't need to look back at A. Uh, you can see this as my for loop, right? For I being one, and then J being two, three, four. For I being two, and J being three, four. For I being B, C, C is going to be D. And so if it's uh, three and then four, right? And that's all of them, right? So how many K combinations, how many two combinations did there end up being? Six here, right? In other words, four choose two, which again is going to be equal to four factorial over four minus two factorial, two factorial, which is equal to uh, four times three, all over two, which is six. Excellent, it worked out, right? So how did we generate these K combinations? Uh, well, we did it with two for loops, right? What if I want three combinations of A, B, C, and D? Well, I did it with two for loops, right? For I running from zero up to, or one up to, in this case, it would only be two for j running from i plus one up to three for k running from j plus one up to four. Right? For this particular example, if of course I went up to n in general, then this would be n minus two, n minus one, and then n. Right? That's a nice pattern to follow. What if I wanted four? I'd have to code four four loops. Five, five five loops. Six, six six loops. Does that, now, now I'm rethinking, does that sound like a good pattern? Not if I want a general uh, combination. For two, for one, for two, maybe even three. Yeah, sure, you've got an argument there for doing four loops. But if you want to generate every single possible subset, right? I want to want to generate every possible subset. Dot dot dot. Can I can I do that pattern? Probably not. Uh, at least not straight in a straightforward way. Uh, so I want to generate every single possible subset. First of all, how many are there? Subsets are there of a set of size n. Well, you have to choose the empty set and choose nothing. You have to choose all the singleton sets and choose one. You have to choose all the pairs, all the triples, dot, dot, dot. You have to choose all the sets that exclude one thing. You have to choose the set that contains all of the elements. Well, if I sum all of these up, what is, uh, what is the size of that? How many possible subsets are there? Factorial? Not factorial, but 
2 to the n. Right? Okay, so here's a really w easy way to conceptualize this first, and then we're going to look at a much better algorithm, uh, not a better algorithm, but ob obviously this is not going to be good in general anyway, right? This is going to be order 2 to the n. That is exponential. Right? We don't want that in general, but let's go ahead and figure out how, what kind of pattern we could follow if in case we needed to do this. For small values, sure, uh, even 10, uh, a set of size 10, 2 to the 10 is not that big. Right? Uh, but if you even get up to s other small values of 20, 30, 40, uh, even up to 100, that's more atoms in the, than the known universe, blah, blah, blah. Right? So this is going to grow very, very, very fast. But for small values, maybe we can get by with it. Right? Um, by the way, that's called the, there's a symbol for this. If I've got a set S and it contains A, B, C, dot, 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 up to N, whatever, then taking all possible subsets of that is called what? P, the power set, right? This is the, the power set. It's the set of all possible subsets, okay? All right, here's an con easy conceptual way that when I do 235, I usually cover it. Uh, and uh, how, how, can we, how, how can we generate these things? Uh, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to write out all possible subsets of a small example, A, B, and C, right? What's one, give me one subset of that. A, uh, itself, okay. Uh, let me write it down here, A, B, C. Give me another subset. The, the, the empty set, right? The singletons, right? A, the set containing B, the set containing C, what else? A, B, A, C, and B, C. And I don't want to write all of these but I will, because I just ended up doing it, even though I said I didn't want to, right? Okay, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to associate each one of these with a Boolean. I'm going to associate it with zero if the element X is in the subset, or is, is not, not in the subset. One, if X is in the subset. Okay, so that means I'm looking at bit strings of length three. Here's the corresponding bit string for each one of these things. In the empty set A, B, and C, none of them are in it, right? So zero, zero, zero. Right? In the bit string uh, for A, if I associate the, you know, the first bit with A, the second bit with B, and the third bit with C, then, uh, oops, sorry, it would be one, zero, zero for the second one. One, or sorry, zero, one, zero, 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 one. Right? For A and B, what would it be? One, one, zero. So do you see the pattern that I'm following here? One, zero, one. Tell me what B, C would be. Anyone? Zero, one, one. And finally, the last one would be one, one, one. Now, I wrote that down on the left-hand side there because that's the lexicographic order of those things. That's the natural ordering. If you were to alphabetize them, that's the order that you would get. What I want to do is I want to take these bit strings and I'm going to reorder them so that it makes even more sense to you. I don't even have to look at it. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. So what I'm doing is I'm reordering these, right? Uh, 1, 0, 0. 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. What did I just do? I counted in binary. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, 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 7. So what's one easy way of generating every single possible subset? You count, right? Count from 0 up to 2 to the n minus 1 generate uh, then convert that to binary and then use that bit vector string in order to build your subset 
That's if you wanted to generate them all. What if I only wanted to generate, say, these, the, the, the doubletons, the, the pairs, or the singletons, or if I had n is 100 and I want, only want subsets of size 10, right? Do I have to generate every single possible subset? No. I'm only interested in those that contain elements of 10. And that, at least from one perspective, is polynomial with respect to n. Remember this, n choose k? Well, if uh, it, 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 this is n factorial all over n minus k factorial, k factorial. Right? Uh, now, in general, this is going to be exponential, right? But consider that down here in the denominator, this thing ends up canceling with a lot of these things up here. And in particular, if we're only looking at pairs, n choose 2, then that's going to be order n squared. What about n choose 3? What do you think that that's going to be? Remember we said it was going to be three for loops, right? So what's your intuition? End of the third, right? Dot, dot, dot. All right, and uh, n choose 4 is going to be order n to the fourth. In other words, in general, n choose k is going to be order n to the k. Now, if you consider k to be a constant, then this looks polynomial. Looks can be deceiving. Uh, what happens in the middle of all this stuff? You, you hopefully, you've seen these things before. They're called binomial coefficients. Uh, they form um, Pascal's triangle, and they are all symmetric, right? We, we've seen this before. Yes, no, uh, no, oh, okay. <laughs> all right, so n choose, uh, let's see. Let me build it. Zero choose zero. One choose zero. One choose one. Uh, two choose zero. Two choose one. Two choose two. Hopefully this is looking a little bit familiar now, right? Uh, three choose zero. Three choose one. Three choose two. Three choose four. Right? Maybe you just never learned that it was called Pascal's triangle. Right? So what are these values? Well, if you choose zero, there's only one way of doing that. So one, 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 one. If you choose everything, there's only one way of doing that. Now, each one of these is going to be a sum. Two. Uh, this ends up being the sum of these two. So one plus two, three. Right? And likewise, three. And you can start to see a pattern emerge here. I'll go one more. 4 choose 0, 4 choose 1, 4 choose 2, 4 choose 3, 4 choose 4. 1, what's it going to be here? 4. All, again, all you have to do is take the two immediately above it and add them together. And that pattern starts to emerge. Right. And you see that it's symmetric. 1, 4, 6, 6, 4, 1. Right? So where is it maximized? It's maximized in the middle, right? If I were to write out this big giant triangle, it's an infinite triangle. Uh, but if I stop somewhere and I look at one particular row of that triangle, the maximum value is always going to be in the center somewhere, right? That's going to be maximized when n, you have n choose n divided by 2, right? That's going to be right in the center there, 4 choose 2, for example. And in that case, can we say that that's polynomial anymore? n choose n divided by 2, that's going to be what? n, right here, it's equal to n divided by n minus n divided by 2 factorial, n factorial, n divided by 2 factorial, sorry. So a lot of stuff will still cancel, but this is still going to be, well, exponential. There's a uh, it's not Euler's formula, but uh, there's a formula uh, that you can get a continuous version of this thing so that you can integrate it and do a bunch of other stuff with it in calculus. Uh, I, f I forget what it's called, though. Uh, Stirling's formula. There we go. I think one of, Sterling, one of Stirling's formulas uh, will tell you that this is going to end up being uh, exponential right here. All right. Yeah? Uh, what do you mean when you said there was multiple ways of doing it? 
Multiple ways of doing what? Oh, well, what, what, what is each one of these things doing? It's telling you the number of ways of choosing K. Uh, 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 let's see. Let me go over here. N choose K is the number of ways of choosing K things from a uh, set of size N. Right? That's what a combination is. Right? So if you were to select nothing from a set of size 4, there's only one way of doing that. You don't select anything. That's the empty set. Uh, if you select everything from a set of size, oh, uh, this would be three right here. Uh, three, there we go. Uh, if you select everything from a set of size four, there's only one way of doing that. Choose everything. Right? That's why it's one. Okay. So how do we go about doing this? Same idea. We just count differently. Okay. So what, uh, actually, uh, let me continue on this. Uh, what I want to do is I want to show you the idea, okay? And for that, I want this example right here. Uh, suppose that we have the following, 2, 5, 6, 9, and 10. And here, k is going to be 5, and say that n is equal to 10, okay? So we've got 10 things. We've got 10 people enrolled in this class. Uh, how many ways are there of choosing five of you to... Uh, go to rock the block next week or whatever, right? And report back to me uh, that they did in fact have canes as promised, right? I can't go, so I can't eat the canes. All right, you know, you all know that you're going to rock the, you, that there's rock the block next week and free canes and free Mr. Goodsense. No, all right, make sure you go. If you like canes, that is. Uh, so I, t I told them, uh, to, well, you're not all, they're, they're mostly advertising it to freshmen, but of course they can't tell the difference. You can still get your canes. Yeah. Say what? Okay, exactly. So do I, especially with a mask on. All right. So what's the next five combination out of this? Again, remember that we're taking combinations of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Uh, well, let's look at the last one here. What if I were to add one to it? 11. Is that in the original set? No. All right. Next, nine. If I were to add one to it, I would have 11 and that, that would be out, uh, out of the range. Nine. Could I add one to it to get the next element? Well, then I'd have a duplicate, right? Okay. So let's go back over to six here, right? I'm counting kind of, right? When you count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and you've run out of digits, right? We've run out of digits here, at least in our set. Uh, we've run out of things. So what do you do? You carry one over, and then you go back to zero and you start over. Or one, zero, 10. Then 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and you've run out of digits again. So what do you do? You add one uh, from your perspective over here, right? And then you start over again. And that's what we're going to do here. We've run out of room. We've run out of room. Hey, we have room to grow here. What can I do with that? I could go to the next value, 7, 9, 10, 5, and 2. Right. So that's the next K combination, next 5 combination. That's the idea. Now what we need to do is we need to codify this as a counting rule. All right. All right. So let me go ahead and go over here. Uh, again, I don't know if anybody's following online, but let me know. Uh, Piazza went to sleep. Sorry. Let me know if it's, it's bad or not. Uh, anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to generate combinations. So generating combinations. So given a set of N elements, and for our purposes, that's simply going to be the elements one, two, three, dot, 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 n. If you want, uh, you know, zero through n minus one, just subtract one. If you want uh, combinations of people, associate each one of those people with one of these numbers, and you're good to go. Right? I'm going to keep it abstract, and we're only going to generate combinations of these integers. Right? So here's my outline. We're going to start with... Well, where's a good place to start? 
with the lexicographically smallest one, one, two, three L dots up to K. All right. There we go. And then uh, we're going to assume that you have a current uh, combination. And we're just going to label that. We don't know what it is. We don't care what it is. But we're going to label that as A1, A2, dot, 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 A sub K. Because remember, there are K of them. We're selecting a subset of size K. Okay? Uh, now what we want to do is we want to generate, we want to generate the next, next K combination. So the first thing we're going to do is just like I described, we're going to lo locate the last one that is not maxed out. Right? So we're going to locate the last element, last element, A sub I, such that A sub I is not equal to N minus K plus one, or plus I, excuse me. Right? It just turns out that that's the equation, right? That's the equation for counting. Uh, in an arbitrary base system. Right? Uh, we're going to replace a sub i with a sub i plus 1, just like I did. Right? I, I replaced, what was it? I replaced 6 with 7. I started at the end. Nope, that's too big, that's too big, that's too big. Oh, okay, fine, I found 6. I'll increment it to 7. Uh, and then we're going to replace each a sub j with a sub i plus j minus i, or a sub i plus j minus i for all j running from i plus 1, i plus 2, up to k. There we go. Okay? So there is our algorithm outline. Now for my purposes here, I'm just going to pull in the pseudocode from uh, the, the, the book or the extensive lecture notes. Uh, it, it's hardly a book uh, yet, uh, but here's the next K combination. Right. That's a pseudocode version of what I just outlined. This is only one step in the process. This is not starting out any particular combination. Here's the current combination. Produce the next combination. Of course, if you want to do this for all combinations, you would have to start out at 1 through k. And then where, when would you end? When there is no further, well, there's, uh, there's no such i such that this, equa uh, this, uh, this inequality holds, or this equality holds. If that's the case, then you can immediately quit. Right? Uh, the last one, of course, would be where you start, if you start out at 1, 2, 3, and you've got 10 elements, then what's your last one? 8, 9, 10. Right? Okay? So what I want to do is I want to go through an example run of this algorithm here first uh, before we uh, actually code it if we have time. Right? So suppose that n is 5 and k is 3. Uh, in other words, the set is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And suppose that our current... 1 is 1, 4, and 5. What is the next one? Right. So what we need to do is we need to locate, by going through this while loop here, we need to locate the last element such that that inequality holds. Right. Uh, so locate uh, 1, locate the last a sub i such that a sub i is not equal to n minus k plus i. Okay? So let's try it for, and again, this is a1, a2, and a3. a3, again, we're starting at the end, and then we're moving forward. Already, you can see that we've maxed out 5, we've maxed out 4, and so 1 is the thing that we're ultimately going to change here with that idea. But I want to go through each step to make sure that we understand it a sub 3 is equal to 5, is that equal or not to n minus k plus i? Well, n and k are going to be fixed throughout this entire process. So 5 minus 3, and then i in this case is 3, so they are equal because this is equal to 5. That's not our guy. 
A2 is equal to 4. Is that equal or not to 5 minus 3 plus i? Right. Well, i in this case is, uh, I think I screwed up. A sub, no, a sub 2. Oh, sorry. All right. Uh, well, here, I'll keep it here. 5 minus 3, that's fixed, but now it's 2 here. So uh, that is 4, so they are equal, right? That is equal to 4, so yes, they are equal. Now the last one, a sub 1, is equal to 1. Is that equal or not to 5 minus 3 plus 1? 5 minus 3, 2 plus 1 is 3. So they are not equal. And this one ends up being the thing that we need to change at this part of the algorithm right here. So what are we going to do? Uh, let me go ahead and give myself some more room here. Hopefully that's still readable. So part two, uh, replace a sub 1 with a sub 1 plus 1. So in other words, this is going to end up being... 2. Okay? But now we need to take care of all of the rest of these. For everything after, what we're going to do is we're going to replace it with a sub i plus j minus i. So a sub 2 becomes what? It becomes a sub i, which is now 2, a sub 1, excuse me, plus j minus i. So this becomes 2 plus, and then j in this case is 2. So 2 minus, and then what i did, uh, did we get out of this? 1. So this is equal to 4 minus 1, 3. Okay. Uh, what about a sub 3? What does that become? It becomes a sub 1 plus j minus i. And in this case, j has changed. This is still 2. But now this is 3, and then the i that gave us all this uh, stuff to go on is unchanged. It's still 1. So 5 minus 1 is 4. And that's the next k combination. 2, 3, 4. Right. Is that right? 2, 3, 4. Yep. Uh, where does j come from? Or where it uh, these, uh, remember that this is 4j running from i plus 1 up to k. So this is my j. Here, I'll annotate all of this. This is j. This is j. This is i. Right? From, from this step, that gave us the i. Right? And then we went into this for loop here where we took care of everything after it. j was, ran from 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. If this last thing here were the thing that we increment, then obviously when we do that while loop or that for loop at the bottom, we would end up not doing anything. Okay? So we are finding multiple by doing Well, we're only finding the next K combination. Two, three, four. The one after that would be, I've got, uh, I don't have it here, but uh, it would end up being, uh, what's the next one? Two, three, five, two, four, five, three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera. And you just have to count like that. Question? So what if you plus the one and it doesn't have to be the set? So. Then if, if that's the case, this while loop would have ended up going out of bounds. Remember that we are decrementing our i. We start at the end, that's not it, that's not it, that is. But under your scenario, we would go, not it, not it, not it, and then fall off the face of the uh, sequence, in which case we know we're done. There are no more k combinations. Right? Yeah? Is this the same as incrementing uh, k digit numbers in base n? <sighs> Don't quote me, but uh, yes, I think so. Okay. Yeah, uh, base n, and then you're basically counting, yeah. Okay. All, right. All right. So there's the idea. We only have about 10 minutes here. 
I'm going to challenge myself and see if we can program this. All right. All right. Uh, remember, uh, uh, we, we can always come back to uh, the pseudocode right here. So, def next combo. Well, first of all, we need the current combo. We also need potentially n and k. Well, we don't need k. Why? Because if that current is our current combination, then taking the length of that tells us what k is. But we do need to know the base, right? n. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to work off of this, all right? So, uh, first of all, we'll increment, uh, we'll, um, the way that I want to do this is let, let's make a copy of it, all right? So import copy. This is a good, uh, teaching moment here. If you import copy. So I gave, I, uh, I, you're the function now. I gave you the current combination. Um, are you going to manipulate that combination and change it? In other words, I've passed it by reference, or do you want to create a new combination and give me that new combination, leaving my original combination untouched? Which one do we want to do? Change it? All right, well, that's not as cool. Right. <laughs> uh, you can change it very easily by, you know, just changing uh, occur in this case, right? Uh, because in Python, all lists and all collections are passed by reference. Uh, so you would end up being, making changes to it, and you can, uh, and those will be seen in the calling function. Uh, let's go ahead and make a deep copy of this, though. All right? So result will end up being a copy dot deep copy of the current. Uh, this is a uh, a copy library. Remember, hopefully, we all remember what a copy versus a deep copy is. Uh, shallow copy is when two references reference the same memory location, and so changes to one affect the other. A deep copy is when you've got two completely separate copies so that one, changes to one don't affect the other. This makes a deep copy of the current so that we're not touching the original, okay? All right, okay, we need that. So that'll be the length of the current or the size of the current uh, combination. Right? So let me go ahead and also document this. We're not going to be able to finish it today anyway, so let's do it proper. Uh, I'll document this, and given a current k combination of a set of values of size, or a set of integers of size n, it produces a new, emphasize that new, uh, a, a, a new list representing the next K combination. Right. There we go. So I didn't end up passing K because I can get that from the length of the current combination. In fact, let's go ahead and understand this a little bit. If we're given, uh, what was it before the, our example before? 145, it'll end up returning to uh, three and four. Okay. So K is our length. Uh, what, what's the first step here? I set I equal to K. I equal to K. But in this case, I'm going to go minus one immediately. Why? Python is zero indexed. Right. So if I want to start at the last element, I'm going to go from zero. In fact, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll change this. Uh, it goes zero three, and four. We're going to give it the next one, which is one, two, and three. Right? We're going to go zero indexing on this because ultimately we want to use these things as indices. Okay? We're just going to be different by one from the pseudocode that we developed. All right. There's a while loop. All I have to do is translate that directly. Let me move it over here. While the current uh, result sub i is equal to n minus k plus i, right? i minus minus. There's a quirk of Python. Is that going to work? Nope. They don't have the nice, convenient minus minus operator. Uh, and unfortunately, Swift took a page out of their playbook, and they introduced it into the language, and then they took it away because 
people like Python. Let's be like Python because they're the cool kids in the block. Right? They're not the cool kids in the block. Uh, but minus equals one will work. You took away minus minus, but you left in the compound assignment operator. Okay. Yeah. Eh, habit. It won't. It won't get in the way. But I did it out of habit. There is a um, a proposal to add in uh, stronger syntax and to require uh, semicolons uh, so that you don't get into problems like that. Uh, and there are some maybe some interpreters that'll help you along that path. But I don't think it's ever been adopted. Right. Nope. It won't break. It'll. It'll just semicolon. Uh, I'm going to ignore that. It's kind of like a comment, right? In fact, Perl, I believe, uses semicolons as its, as its single line comments. Weird. You could, but it's not Pythonic, okay. right? <laughs> if, if you want to, I mean, if you took your code and showed it to another Pythoner, uh, they'd say, oh, uh, ugly. Uh, if you looked at, if I, if, even if I looked at it at this point, I would say, is that really Python? <laughs> like, what, what the hell is that, right? Okay, uh, I want to look good. Yeah. <laughs> you want it to look Pythonically pretty. <laughs> All right. So we want to take care of the situation where we've fallen off the edge, right? If i is less than 0, then we've broken out of that while loop without finding a candidate to replace. So we'll go ahead and return none. Remember, none is the Pythonic uh, null, right? It is capital N, not lowercase n. It is not null. There is no null. It is none. Okay. Otherwise, what do we do? We add one to it. Results of i is equal to results of i plus one. And you could shorthand that at least a little bit. Instead of going plus plus, though, you have to go plus equals, right? And then I go into my for loop for j. And here we'll just do a traditional uh, for loop for j in the range of i plus 1 up to k. Yeah, I think that this will work. Yeah. Up in here in the pseudocode, it goes up to an including k. Uh, now, if I were to translate to this to actual code, I would go k minus 1. But that's what the range function does for me automatically. It will only go from this first number, inclusive, to this last number, exclusive. All right, so we're already there. All right. All right, and then return. Oh, I guess we need to do something, right? Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, result sub j is equal to uh, result sub i plus j minus i. Is that right? Yep. And then we'll return result. So when I type Python, I'm always typing extra characters because I'm always instinctively putting a semicolon and then erasing it immediately. Remembering, don't do that. Right. Okay, let's test it. Uh, A, uh, let's go with n is equal to, what, uh, what did we do? 5, k is equal to 3. <laughs> uh, A uh, is equal to uh, let's see, 0, 3, and 4, or yeah, 0, 3, and 4, and then we'll go with result is equal to next combo of A and N, and then print that next combo. Are we going to get 1, 2, 3? I don't know if I did everything correct, maybe. Uh, is this a demo? Yep. Everybody cross their fingers with me. Ha, <laughs> cool. We did it. Yay. All I had to do was translate this pseudocode. Right? Good pseudocode can be translated into any language. You just have to be careful. Right? We, uh, in the pseudocode, we didn't have, uh, by the way, if there is no such a sub i, then output that you're done. Right? That was a kind of the implementation details. If I were in C, I would return null, or, or I would re may maybe return the same value itself, uh, or something like that. Right? Let's see if it works with a much uh, larger uh, value. So uh, I want a, I don't know, let's go ahead and reset n to uh, 6 and k to 3. So we're going to create 
all subsets of size three from the set of size six. Uh, and we're going to go into a loop to do this, right? So combo, I'll start out with a list of the range of K, right? That'll start out at zero, one, two. By the way, I have to wrap it in a list because a range does not actually return a list. It returns this iterable object that is lazily, uh, that's lazy, that it only, uh, I, I'm not gonna, if you ask for, uh, the range from zero to a million, I'm not going to create a list of size million. That would be wasteful. You need to ask me for the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. It's something that is iterable. I'm not going to create them all up front in case you never ask me for any of that stuff. That's what lazy instantiation or lazy loading or lazy operations are, right? So I have to wrap it up into a list in order to force it to create all those numbers, right? Once I've got that combo, what I'll do is I'll go into a loop while uh, current is not none, right? uh, I'll go with uh, current is equal to combo, or I guess combo, I'll just use combo here. While the combo is not none, I will go ahead and print the combo and then get the next combo. Combo is equal to next combo of combo and n, combo, combo, combo. And then uh, that's it, right? Let's see if we can generate, in fact, uh, let's make sure that, uh, that we have a, a sanity check here. If anybody wants to, they can go ahead and we'll open up Wolfram Alpha and tell me what six choose three is. And I'm going to keep a counter here, right? Count plus plus, or is equal to, uh, plus equals one. And then we're going to print count. How many of them actually were generated? 21, I think my counter is off. Uh, should be what? Six choose three is what? Anyone? <laughs> Can't find the button, can you? <laughs> Probably going to be 24, isn't it? I need your help because if I try to open up Wolfram Alpha, mine's going to crash. <laughs> okay, so I am off by one. But that's me because... I started at one and I overcounted, that's why I should have started at zero. There we go. But you can verify that each one of them is there. Uh, oh, that one, two, three is from the previous test case there. Is that in zero, one, two, all the way up to three, four, five, and there were 20 of them. Yep, good. Uh, duck, duck, go was able to come up with the answer. Duck, duck, go knows where is it, where its button is. <laughs> Any questions? Otherwise, we kind of went over time there. Hopefully, you're okay with that occasionally. I'll try to make up for it next time. I could right. just be misremembering, but I assume there was like a, a slightly easier way for me to how to do like the something to something else. It wasn't like having all the factorial 